Just it was a good story. I still have the TRS-80, I think, back in my parents' place. I'm going to go see if I can dig that out. Huh. Okay, it's Python on hardware time. So this week, in the newsletter, we've got a bunch of stuff going on. CircuitPython 7.1.0 oh, final is out. I'm going to skip uh, this part, which is I'm going to play a video, the nine-part video of us getting ready to get floppy support, being able to control all this cool retro hardware with CircuitPython. But the most important thing this week, please everyone, 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 as 2022 starts, for the last three years, we've put together a post. 2019, 2020, 2021, even though some of those years probably should be uh, removed from the calendar. Um, what we want is you to tell us what you want in CircuitPython. Um, just put your thoughts in one place. Tell, you, tell us what you like about it. Tell us the things that you want to add to it. You could do a video on YouTube, a post in a CircuitPython forum. Stuff you want to do. A blog post, um, a series of tweets, a uh, guest on GitHub. Um, or you can just email to CircuitPython2020 at adafruit.com and just let us know if it's okay for us to post your thing that you send us on our blog and more. Um, you can also uh, use the short URL. Well, it's short-ish. Uh, adafruit.com forward slash CircuitPython 2020. And that'll take you to the blog post and more. What's cool is you can see CircuitPython evolve uh, all this time because we built so cool. a good community together. A good community of people that is very inclusive that would always give you a ride in their cool car. <laughs> so And give each other a ride. And what yeah. I like is, um, Every year you see stuff that we say we're going to do, and, I'll, and most of that list actually gets done. Like we are um, making constant, consistent progress, both on the community side, the documentation side, the hardware side. Um, so many little things that, you know, when we, we work fast and work hard, there's a lot that we've added. Um, we have like over 250 boards supported. We have hundreds and hundreds of libraries supported. Um, with Blinka, we support another like 50 Linux boards and like believe me if it didn't work we would get a lot more emails so it's it's really working out um our hardware other people's hardware people are, are depending and using on um adafruit libraries adafruit software adafruit firmware adafruit hardware the whole shebang and the cool thing is everything is totally open source so people um are mixing and max mixing and matching it with other hardware um getting stuff working and uh having a really good time so uh, join in CircuitPython and Python for hardware is is something that I think is um, has really uh, been an important change and update to the way people code in the maker community and engineering community. I still write code in Arduino, C, C++, Assembler, and, and other people do too, and that's fine, but I think this is a really welcome new family member. Yeah. I like the um, post-holiday tweets and... Uh uh, emails that we get because folks say, oh, I was able to get a project up and running in less than an hour because that's all I wanted to spend on it anyways. Yeah. And they didn't have to do a tool chain, didn't have to do anything. They just plugged in a board, they modified a little bit of code, and now they had this like beautiful blinky thing for their you know, granddaughter or something like that. So I thought that was, um, that was really nice to hear. Um, and by the way, that's the other side of the coin sometimes. Um, you know, one out of a thousand things ain't great, but you have to focus on the 999 um, I got to tell myself that a bunch too. Um, so check out this week's newsletter. There is a bunch going on. Um, Professor John Gallagher has a bunch of stuff going on. There's a video on programming um, the Fibonacci micro 64 LED board using CircuitPython. Codes on GitHub and more. You can make a RISC-V chip run CircuitPython. This store is really cool, by the way. Yes. Um, there's a CircuitPython online ID update. And then um, don't forget Scott's deep dive this week. And then we have some other news that you know usually folks who are tuned into this stuff, um, or even if you're not, maybe you want to know about it. Uh, KiCad six, uh, sorry, KiCad. KiCad six is up. You say um, KiCad, I'll say KiCad, and yeah. together we've covered it. No, we should uh, hate each other forever and uh, kill the KiCaders and, and, and uh, <laughs> murder you know, the just, just dunk on each other forever <laughs> and uh, completely be jerks about it. Um, and so, anyhow, what I wanted to do is uh, make sure we built in enough time this week. Um, I didn't really expect to do a rant, but I did. Sorry. And uh, play the video. So we first have. First rant of 2022. So proud <laughs> no, of you. That was not the first rant of 2022. This is the first one that's been broadcast. <laughs> um, so uh, this video that we're going to show now is beginning to almost present. So it's nine videos in one, nine one minute videos, altogether about eight minutes. And it has zero to getting uh, a Raspberry Pi Pico RP2040 to completely control read-write archive a floppy drive with a floppy disk in it. So it's super cool. All right, here we go. OK. 
calculated or what's this? Okay, those are index pulses coming from this floppy drive that I am interfacing with. I just got, you know, the first kind of parts going where I enable the motor and I'm setting the direction. I'm gonna, you know, get the index pulses and then I'm going to find out when it's at track zero. Um, so basically kind of trying to read data off of this floppy drive so I can add native floppy disk support to CircuitPython. Um, soon I'll uh, update this to maybe use the RP2040 as well. Um, right now I'm just writing the code in Arduino because that's what I'm familiar with. So I finally got all the IDC pins set up the way I needed to. What was really helpful was this um, really, really nice modern data sheet from Samsung for the SFD321B. Uh, so it actually goes through everything you need. Um, and uh, so far so good. So I've just started basically getting the motor running. The floppy disk is responding so far, so good. Hi! Data, uh, I wanna copy that floppy. That's right. Uh, here I've got some more stuff going on with my floppy disk controller that we're gonna add to CircuitPython. So yellow traces you can see uh, is the index pulse that goes low and then you see this like moving blue line. That's actually data coming out of the floppy drive. If I click the single button, you can see the data comes out and it comes out as these pulses that are like you know, they're they're supposed to kind of be like a PWM, but they're actually just very low, low pulses. And then there's a pull up to pull it up high. And you can see that the um, data comes in, you know, in, in various widths. And um, so that's actually the tough part of reading a floppy is this is about 500 kilohertz. And the pulse width varies encoding the data. So over here, I'm actually doing something a little naughty. I'm not using a PLL. I'm actually just very, very quickly uh, in a no interrupt loop um, reading those pulses and printing out the pulse widths. And I'm gonna see if that's good enough to read data from a floppy drive. Okay, nice Nordic shirt. Hey data, what are we doing? Okay, so uh, part three of my floppy project is I've got the data coming out of the read pin. And this is um, a GPIO pin I'm toggling up and down to show that I'm properly reading the pulse widths uh, for the data that's coming out in MFM format. And then what I've done over here is um, you can see I'm capturing flux transition and I've got a Cortex M4 here with like 256K of RAM. And so it's actually totally fine for me to just buffer the entire track of flux transitions because there's only 100,000 uh, transitions maximum per track. Um, and you can see that there's a little bit of bending here. So there's a couple of pulses, you know, a lot of pulses around 40. And then down here, we've got pulses around 60. And then finally, we've got pulses around 80. We've got a couple extra long ones, which is a little bit weird. Like, why is it 228? So a little bit more to analyze here. But I'm starting to get data coming in, and the data looks right. Hey, data, what is this? Okay, so we're doing some floppy drive hacking, and I've got this like original three and a half inch floppy drive, but these are actually hard to get because they're not made anymore. So I was wondering, you know, there's these off the shelf USB floppy disks, and you know, can I somehow use those? So I opened one up, I cracked it open, and it actually has a SFD321S Samsung three and a half inch floppy drive with a little adapter here, and the adapter's got a little cheap chip on the back, and there's all these points here and I'm hoping can I get flux transitions out of here because I don't want it to do the translation for me I want to get that raw data well good news um, I found a really nice person online who actually did the uh, pinouts and then when I access the disk you can see on the scope I get my index and flux transitions so you know normally if you use these USB floppy drive converters you don't you know, they, they give you like a, a, a USB mass storage, but this way you can get that archival quality flux transition data. Hey, what is this? Okay, I still got my Panasonic floppy disk drive and my Feather that I'm interfacing with. And I've gotten flux data out, and now I want to get that flux data from the disk drive and the Feather into the computer. So I'm using this open source tool called Grease Weasel, and I'm updating it to support... Um, this setup that I've got here. So basically I'm reporting the Grease Weasel firmware into Arduino. So far so good. There's some like flux opcode thing that I gotta figure out. Like I've got the flux data leaving here. Um, you can see it's got the flux data sent and then over here it says, okay, it got the flux data, but then there, I have to like somehow encode the index. So I'm getting there, I'm close to getting raw data dumps onto my computer using totally open source hardware and software. Hey, okay, happy new year. Happy new year. Boom. Hey, what is this? This is the first floppy disk I'm gonna try reading with my Grease Weasel compatible firmware on this Feather M4 hooked up to this floppy disk. 
Um, so I've got flux data and track seeking working and I'm able to get some tracks working, like some tracks are reading just fine. I'm also getting some tracks where it's like, it doesn't see any sector data. And I think that's probably because like the flux data format I'm sending or the index, whatever um, opcode I'm sending isn't quite right. But for those first few sectors that I do get working, um, the data is good. So I'm just gonna have to figure out what it is that I'm doing that's slightly wrong. Um, but I feel like I'm getting closer, at least I'm seeking and I'm getting some data uh, working from the beginning of the disk track. What is this? Okay, I think I figured out all my power supply issues and my flux timing issues, and I'm really ready to read the secret disk that I got that they hid in that place that one time. Right. Thank you, Asenburn. So I'm gonna put this in my floppy drive, and then over here on Grease Weasel, I'm going to start capturing track data. So I'm gonna capture all the MFM IBM PC sector tracks, all 80 times two headers. So 160 total tracks. Okay, so we have read all of the sectors 100%. So it's ready to uh, open up win image. We're gonna open up that secret image. Oh my God, it's gonna open, but I'm gonna open it anyways. Oh, no. Yeah, let's just open it. Oh no! Not um, again. Uh, yeah. I just got Rickold on my own floppy disk reader. Yeah, dude, what is this? Okay, so we've still got our floppy setup going on here where we're capturing flux traces from a three and a half inch floppy drive. But I've replaced the Feather M4 7051 with this pink feather, not just because pink is a cool color, but because this feather has an RP2040 on it which is a low cost chip from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And this chip can run really fast. It also has this cool PIO uh, peripheral. So we're overclocking it to 200 megahertz, but why not? We're getting good uh, flux captures over here. And uh, when we recompiled it and we're running a grease weasel, it's just working. So this is cool because now I've got two different platforms that work with this Arduino library, which is the goal to make it hardware agnostic so more people can um, wire up hardware and build hardware to work with floppy disk drives. And then next up, maybe we'll try this little fellow, the Raspberry Pi Pico, $4 microcontroller board. What is this? Okay, I'm wrapping up for the night. It's getting a little late. Time to maybe do some yoga and chill out. <laughs> um, so I've got um, the final board I'm gonna interface with. This is the Raspberry Pi Pico. So this is a $4 microcontroller. Um, and the reason I'm targeting this is it's available, like DigiKey has 17,000 of them in stock, and some of the hardware that people are using for open source floppy interfacing isn't available because we're in a silicon shortage, but this chip is available. So it's nice is that the pinouts like kind of line up very nicely. You can um, connect them straight through to your floppy disk drive, um, and then load the um, Arduino code onto it, and I set up the pinouts all nicely. and. Um, tested it, uh, read a whole floppy just fine, and then I've submitted this to the um, Arduino library registry so you'll be able to get releases, and maybe I'll even have it auto-generate UF2 files. So I think I'm done for tonight. Maybe time to celebrate. Good with, uh, work. Glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, and that's CircuitPython news for this week. So this is beginning, middle, and present to get, to, get mm. us where we wanted to be. So we would be able to start to add support for all sorts of removable drives and more. Um, you know, we got some dunks and snarks about why would you do this? Well, there's a lot of media that is about to just go away forever unless we preserve it, put online and more. And also, you can't get hardware, so you may as well. Uh, can't get new chips. Get old chips. Re revitalize this hardware that a lot of people mm -hmm. have instead of throwing it in the landfill. Yeah. You like the planet, don't you? Yeah, this is a good way to reuse it. And um, so we're adding CircuitPython support. The Jepler's working on that. And um, I'm going to get back to adding uh, more Arduino support uh, shortly. Took a little bit of a break um, just to, to get back to business stuff, to get all the new products in the store we're going to talk yeah. about shortly. But okay. more to come. Cool. Um, Never ending. Let's uh, jump to main New York City factory footage. We're going to do 3D printing. Then we're going to go right into INMPI and then new products and some top secret. And we should just be able to get it all in tonight okay. so take it away uh link and get us out of here and it's time for main new york city factory footage